All right, so um, yeah, so the sermon I've got today is, uh, is called Murmuring and Complaining. Um, so this is something obviously that comes up a lot. It's very easy for us to do, to, to be murmurers and complainers, but um, you know, the Bible makes it clear that this is, a, this is actually something that God despises. Um, so I'll get you to turn to Acts uh, chapter 20, but I'll just read to you from Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. Um, But where does murmuring and complaining come from? So some of the causes, the the two biggest causes are covetousness and envy, um, which is things that will come out of your heart. So in Exodus 20, 17, it says, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbour's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbour's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbour's. So coveting is, is when you're... Uh, desiring something that doesn't belong to you. You're desiring what belongs to your neighbour. So he might have worked hard for the things he has and you're desiring to have what he has. But the Bible says that thou shalt not cover. So that's a clear commandment from God. It's actually one of the Ten Commandments. Um, so there's no you know, ambiguity about that. Um, in Luke 12, 15, it says, Then he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not, consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. So again, your heart shouldn't be in the things that you possess. Your heart should be in the things of God. And that's why we read Matthew 6. It goes through that, you know, even God's going to take care of you and we'll see all of that soon. Um, But it says the man's life doesn't consist in the abundance of the things you have. And so then judging yourselves against other people who have other things, things that you desire, that's where it says there's wickedness in your heart when you desire things that don't belong to you. And it will actually cause you to do other grievous sins to obtain those things. Um, and in Acts 20, verse 32, you'll be there. It says, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. So Paul understood that God provides. So he doesn't need to cover what other men have because God's going to provide all his necessities. You know, and this is something we need to understand as well. If we trust in the Lord, we're not going to covet another man's things. And even a brother that's covet- covetousness, we are not to keep company with him. You know, so God considers it a great sin to be covetous, even to the point where it was included in the Ten Commandments. So I'll get you to turn to Isaiah 29, and we'll be there shortly. But in 1 Corinthians 5.11 it says, But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous, or an idolater or a railer, or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one, no, not to eat. So covetousness is something we're to avoid at all costs. Um, not, even, not just amongst ourselves, but also even brethren. We should you know, depart from brethren who are covetous people. And the other one is envy. So that's also when you desire something that belongs to another. It's not to be confused with jealousy, where you're actually protective of something that belongs to you. So you should be jealous of your wife. You should be jealous of your children. You should be jealous of what is yours, because God is jealous of his people. You know, they belong to God. So God, jealousy is not a bad thing. God's name is jealous. But it's important to understand the difference between envy and jealousy. So envy is very close to covetousness, where you desire something that belongs to another. In Proverbs 14.30, it says, A sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy is the rottenness of the bones. And Proverbs 23.17 says, Let not thine heart envy sinners, but be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. So we also shouldn't envy how the world lives. You know, it's not as good as it appears, and you know what their end is going to be anyway. Um, So they might appear to be happy and they appear to be getting away with things, you know, their sinful life, their wickedness, but you know that's not true. They're not going to get away with anything. Every man will be judged according to his work. So if these people aren't judged in this life, then you know what the end of their wicked life is anyway. So that's not something we should envy. It's not something we should go for. Um, Proverbs 27.4 says, Wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous, but who is able to stand before envy? So envy will actually destroy you too, as will covetousness. That will destroy you from the inside out. That's why it says it's envy is the rottenness of the bones. You know, it eats at you from the inside out. 
but they'll also cause you to murmur and complain against the Lord and against his people. So what we're going to see now is how this takes place. So you'll be there in Isaiah 29. We'll start in verse 13 of Isaiah 29. It says, Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honour me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. So they didn't have a real fear, fear of God. They had a fear that was taught by the precepts of men, not the precepts of God. And it goes on to list the wickedness that they're doing in the land because they fear not God with a godly fear. And their heart is far from him, so they're backslidden. You know, this nation of Israel at this time is backslidden. But look at verse 22 in, in Isaiah chapter 29. It says, Therefore thus saith the Lord who redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob, Jacob shall not now be ashamed, neither shall his face now wax pale. But when he seeth his children, the work of mine hands, in the midst of him they shall sanctify my name and sanctify the Holy One of Jacob and shall fear the God of Israel, that they also, they also that erred in spirit shall come to understanding and they that murmured shall learn doctrine. So that's talking about bringing the nation of Israel back to the Lord after they're backslidden, after they've forgotten the things of God because their hearts are far from him. And murmuring tends to come from ignorance. It's either forgetting what the Lord's done for you in the past or you're just ignorant of his doctrines and his promises. Um, so that you've got the doctrine there, as we read, if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you, that's food, raiment, you know, even if God clothes the birds, you know, and, and the flowers and everything else, you know, you're going to be arrayed, you know, even better than those. You know, because God will take care of you and he'll make sure you're taken care of. But you have to, have to seek him first. But one reason that people complain is they forget what they've been given. They actually forget what God's, been, God's done for them and they forget those promises of God. So I'll read to you from Psalm 37, 25. It says, I have been young and am now old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. And David's absolutely right here because I can say I've witnessed the same thing, is it's a promise from the Lord that his children will be provided for. You know, no righteous man who's born of God, so who's saved, you know, will, if you remember these things um, and you set your eyes on the things of God, on heavenly things, you will never have to worry about where your clothes come from, you'll never have to worry about your next meal, you'll never have to worry about your necessities because God will provide those things. And we know he's able. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. He can provide whatever we need. And he knows our needs. So um, if you want to turn to Matthew chapter 6, this was the uh, verse we read, uh, the chapter we read before. Matthew 6, verse 31. It says, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink? For wherewithal shall we be, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things did the Gentiles seek. So even then, the world, this is what the world seeks. The world's going, you know, I don't know where my next paycheck's coming from. I don't know where my next meal's coming from. But we know that no matter what, God's going to provide for us. So we don't seek like the Gentiles seek. Obviously, he's, you know, he's speaking to Jews here. But, you know, you apply it to the world. We don't seek what the world seeks. Because it says, For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So, you know, God knows what we need today, so he's going to provide what we need today. We don't have to worry about tomorrow. We don't have to worry about next week, six months from now. We just trust in the Lord and seek him first. And all those things will be added unto us. So he'll provide what we need from day to day. And that's why we just need to seek him every day. But what we don't see, we don't have to murmur against the Lord for him to give us our needs. He's going to do that because he loves us and because we're his children. But we see that Israel did forget that. They forgot this doctrine. You know, not soon after they were led out of Egypt, they forgot everything that God had done for them. Um, when he led them out, they had gold and food and cattle and all sorts of goods. You know, God destroyed the Egyptians before their eyes in the, you know, when they crossed the Red Sea. And yet they forgot all these things. 
And they, they sort of stopped, you know, trusting in God and believing that he was able to provide for them, even though they knew that he'd, he'd already done all that. He'd already provided for them. Um, so I'll get you to turn to Exodus chapter 16. And this is the story where God provides manna from heaven for them to eat. So every day they had to go out and to gather manna from the ground. Uh, every day except for on the, on the Sabbath day. So they'd go out on the sixth day and grab twice as much um, so that they had enough prepared to last them through the Sabbath day because there was no work to be done on the Sabbath. Uh, but if you understand the story that um, they would not be able to gather more than they needed, it would actually be rotten overnight. So they could only gather what was enough for that day. And that's what we saw here in Matthew 6 as well. You know, take no thought for tomorrow. God only provided for that day. He didn't provide for tomorrow except in that instance where they couldn't work on the Sabbath. He, did, he also miraculously allowed that sixth day to last two days. Um, but in Exodus 16 verse 5, it says, And it shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in. It shall be twice as much as they gather daily. And Moses and Aaron said unto the children of Israel, At even, then you shall know that the Lord hath brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning then you shall see the glory of the Lord. For he that heareth your murmurings against the Lord, and what are we that ye murmur against us? And Moses said, This shall be, when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full. For the Lord heareth your murmurings, which ye murmur against him. And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. And Moses spake unto Aaron, Say unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for you have heard your murmurings. And it come to pass that Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness. And behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Speak unto them, saying, At even ye shall eat flesh, and in the morning ye shall be filled with bread, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. So this is another point where he's trying to bring them through correction to, you know, you're going to know that I'm God. I'm going to show you another miracle because you've forgotten everything I've already done for you, but I'm going to do this for you. But do you notice that they were murmuring about the men of God? They were murmuring about Moses and Aaron, but they were really murmuring against the Lord because the Lord does take it personally when you murmur against the men he's placed in authority. You know, you're, you're actually not defying those men, you're actually defying God at that point. And God, he heard them, and at this time he showed mercy because he wanted to prove the people of Israel. And uh, we, but we see that the murmuring against the Lord actually brings his hot displeasure. He's actually very, very furious about it. And that should frighten us. When we know that when we murmur against the man of God, the people he's established as our authority, you know, that you're actually murmuring against God and he takes that personally. He actually is furious with that. And that should, that should put the fear of the Lord into us. Um, so I'll get you to turn to Numbers chapter 11. In Numbers chapter 11, we'll read verse 1 to 3. It says, And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. And the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled. And the fire of the Lord burnt among them, and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. And the people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. And he called the name of the place Taborah, because the fire of the Lord burnt among them. Now just imagine that sight. You're complaining against the Lord, you're murmuring against Moses, and suddenly God appears and starts burning the place down. Yeah. Like, how furious is he? You know, it's not a place we want to be. Uh, move down to verse number eight, uh, sorry, verse number six. It says, but now our soil is dried away. There is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. So God's just provided, we just read before, that he's provided this manna to them as a food to eat every single day. And yet now they're complaining about that. That's not good enough for them. You know, they want something more. Go down to verse number 18 now. Same chapter, Numbers 11. It says, and say thou unto the people, sanctify yourselves against tomorrow and ye shall eat flesh. For ye have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Who shall give us flesh to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt, therefore the Lord will give you flesh, and you shall eat. So that sounds nice, doesn't it? 
but actually if we continue on the story, you can see that God is still furious with them. It says, You shall not eat one day, nor two days, nor five days, neither ten days, nor twenty days, but even a whole month, until it comes out at your nostrils and it be loathsome unto you, because that you have despised the Lord which is among you, and have wept before him, saying, Who can, Why came we forth out of Egypt? So again, they, they were complaining, the manna's not good enough. God just says, you know what? You want, you want flesh, you want quail. I'm going to give you so much quail, it's coming out of your nose and you are just sick of it. Because God, you know, this, this just makes him so mad. And we should be fearful that we don't make God mad when we become covetous, when we become envious, when we start murmuring and complaining against God, the things he's given us, and the people, the men, the leadership that he's given us. You know, so God's placed them in our life. He's ordained governments. He's ordained pastors. He's ordained fathers. And, you know, your boss at work, your master, you know, and you're a servant at work. That's what God's ordained. You know, and it should give you fear to murmur and complain against those people, knowing that the Lord hears that murmuring. He hears that complaining. And that you're actually murmuring against the Lord when you do that. So I want you to keep that in mind. You know, if you ever catch yourself murmuring against the man of God or murmuring against one of these authorities that God's placed in your life, just try and catch yourself. And this is something we need to stop. You know, it's something I'm sure we're all guilty of from time to time that we find ourselves wanting to complain about the things we have. But we really need to, to not do that. I'll get you to turn to Exodus chapter 17. So in Exodus 17, we, uh, we also see another instance where they murmured against Moses. In verse number 2, Exodus 17, verse 2, it says, Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide you with me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses, and they said, Wherefore is it that thou hast brought us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? So th we saw this exact same thing. I was saying, you know, well, we're better off in Egypt. You know, even though they had the manna, they had water, you know, they had everything they needed. God provided everything they needed. He was traveling with them, with the tabernacle, you know, in that pillar of fire and smoke. And yet they still were looking back to Egypt with envy, you know, coveting the things of Egypt things that God hadn't given to them. And, and they just constantly wanted to go back there. And we see in verse 7, Exodus 17, verse 7, it says, because the, children of, of, because the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? That's why he called that name place uh, Massa and Meribah. So they gave them water, they smote the rock, and God gave them water. But we see so many times they just forget the great miracles they'd already witnessed. Like this is Exodus 17. This is not the first thing they've seen. They've already crossed the Red Sea. They've already destroyed the Egyptians. God's already provided manna. And yet they've still forgotten all those provisions. You know, so, and that just leads to more murmuring and complaining against the man of God and the Lord himself. And all of this here with, you know, this picture of the rock, that was actually a picture of Christ. Um, you know, Jesus, he's the manna, he's the bread from heaven, but he's also, he's the water from that stone. We see that in John chapter 6, if you want to turn there. John chapter 6, verse 53. And this is what Jesus says about himself. But he performed that, that miracle twice. Well, once when he smote the rock, once when Moses was supposed to talk to the rock and water would come forth, but he ruined that picture by smiting the rock a second time. Um, but he did perform that miracle twice. And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. 
These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? And when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Does this offend you? What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you, that no man can come unto me except it were given him of my Father. From that time many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. So Christ is teaching here that he's the bread of life. He was that, he was that manna from heaven. That's what that picture, the God's provision, he was that manna from heaven who came down and died for us. He was also that spiritual rock from which they drank those living waters in the desert. Um, we know those Old Testament signs and miracles were also written for our benefit and our admonition. But we see that many could not receive this saying, even his very disciples, even people who were following him for a long time. Some of them stopped following him that day because they just couldn't handle what he was saying. And they, they, they were offended, but, and that's why they murmured against him, because they were offended. Um, so we'll get you to turn to Numbers chapter 14. So we see God, in, in Numbers 14, God actually gets to the point where he wants to destroy the entire nation of Israel and start again. Like, you know you've messed up pretty badly when God's just like, you know what, I don't want to leave any of you alive. Like, that's pretty bad. And it's all from murmuring and complaining. So in Numbers 14, verse 1, it says, All the congregation lifted their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would to God we had died in the land of Egypt. Or would God we had died, we had died in this wilderness. Again, they're constantly looking back to Egypt. Always looking back. They're not looking at the things God has done for them, but they're going, hey, the world had better things. We want those things. But God's already given them such great provision. He's, given them, he's promised them a nation of their own, all their lands, everything. They just walk in and take it. But they didn't have faith. That's why they didn't enter in. It says that in Hebrews chapter 3. They entered in, not in because of unbelief. Uh, verse number three. And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return unto Egypt? And they said one to another, Let us make a captain and let us return unto Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before the assembly and the congregation of the children of Israel. Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephuni, which were of them that had searched the land, rent their clothes. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, the land which we pass through to search it, it is, an, it is an exceeding good land. So again, this is the land God promised. They weren't looking at the promises of God. They weren't looking at what God had already done and said, hey, God's going to come through for this because he came through for all this other stuff. But they saw the land. They saw giants in the land. They saw things they didn't like and they said, well, this is going to be too hard. Let's just go back to Egypt and let's just live in luxury in Egypt and just enjoy the things that they have. But that's not what God wanted for them. That's not what God had prepared for them. So they're murmuring against the Lord. Uh, verse number eight, If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. So these men had faith. That's why Joshua actually got to enter into the promised land. Because these men had faith. You know, but the rest entered not in because of unbelief. And that's why they never got to see the land. Um, so verse 10, But all the congregation bade stone with them with stones. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? And how long will it ere they believe me? For all the signs which I have showed among them, I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them and I will make thee a greater nation and a mightier than they. So if, if Moses hadn't interceded at this point, we see later he does, then I believe that God would have destroyed that entire nation and started again with Moses. And that would have changed a lot of things. Um, but this is where murmuring and complaining can take you. It can get you to the point where God just despises you. 
He just despises, because all you can do is just complain about everything he's done. And he's done nothing but good for us. We owe him so much. Like even, if, even if he only gave us eternal life, salvation, that's enough. He's given us more than we ever deserve. But he still gives us so much more abundance than that. So we should always be thankful for what he's done. Never backbiting and never murmuring and complaining about the things God's done for us. So, and that's where that, that covetousness and envy will lead you. You know, we should be satisfied with the things God's given to us. You know, he's prepared a land for them and they forgot the Lord and wanted to go back to Egypt. Well, God's also prepared a land for you. He's prepared, what, you know, rewards for you. He's prepared work for you. He's prepared things he wants you to have. And it's up to you to actually, you know, follow through with that, to actually do the works, to earn those rewards, but also to be grateful for what he does give. Because if he gives you a little and you're grateful with that, then he might give you much more. But if he gives you a little and you just murmur and complain, you're not going to get anything else. In fact, he might even take away everything that you have. Because you've got to be grateful for what God gives you. And it's about trusting in God. So if you just turn over a couple of pages to Numbers chapter 16. See the exact same thing again. It's just a pattern with these people. But it's, it's a pattern that we also can reproduce. So we need to be, this is a warning for us. If it can happen to them, we can do the same. We've got the same flesh. We've got the same nature of man. So in Numbers chapter 16 verse 1, most people will be familiar with this story. It says, Now Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, the sons of Reuben, took men, and they rose up against Moses, and certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron, and said unto them, Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. And when Moses heard it, he fell upon his face. So we see the humility of Moses, he falls on his face, you know, because he's trying to diffuse the situation with these wicked men. But we see Numbers in verse 8, Numbers 16, verse 8, And Moses said unto Korah, here I pray you, ye sons of Levi, seemeth it but a small thing unto you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them? And he hath brought thee near to him and all thy brethren of the sons of Levi with thee and seek ye the priesthood also? For which cause both thou and all thy company are gathered together against the Lord and what is Aaron, that ye murmur against him? So these people were already, the sons of Levi, they're already set apart to work in the tabernacle. They're already set apart to be God's people. Like, this is God's inheritance. The Levite, the children of Levi were God's inheritance. That's the 10% he took for himself against all the nation of Israel. Uh, but they still wanted more. They just weren't happy with what they had. They were not content. But they also wanted to divide the people and to take authority for themselves, which is not the authority that God had given. Because it's the Lord who exalts. It's the Lord who abases. If, you know, if you're humble, God will lift you up. If you're proud, then God will smite you right down. So, you know, that's, that's another good lesson for us. You know, murmuring against Aaron is what these people are doing because they wanted, they envied his position. They wanted the priesthood also. They wanted everything... But that's not what God gave them. God had already given them so much. Being the children of Levi, they were God's inheritance set apart already. They got to enjoy the food of the temple. They got to enjoy all the, all the things that God provided for them. But it brought that insurrection and rebellion against, against Moses. And that's what envy and covetousness will do. It will actually cause you to fight against people, to fight against your brethren, to fight against people who have something that you want. Because you're going you're gonna to take it. If your heart truly desires that thing, you're going to do wicked things to get it. And that's not how it should be. Um, and we shouldn't have uh, men's person in admiration either, because that leads to divisions. It creates factions, and that, that, you know, then you can get rebellions rising up because of these factions. So 
but we all, we all know what the response was, but we'll read that in a second in Numbers 16, 31. But he swallowed up Korah and all those in rebellion and put them right into the pit of hell while they were still alive. And that's God's judgment on murmurers, complainers, and people who want to rebel against the man of God and rebel against God. And again, that should put the fear of God into you. So Numbers 16.31 says, And it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up and their houses, and all the men that appertained unto Korah, and all their goods, they and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. And all, re- all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them, for they said, Lest the earth swallow us up also. So you'd think that this display would give them some humility, that they would sit in there and think, and, you know, well, God's given us these leaders, he's given us Moses, he's given us Aaron, and, you know, what these, what these guys did was wrong, and God was right to do this for them. So that would be the correct response, wouldn't it? But uh, if you read in verse 41, we see what actually happens. And it says, But on the morrow all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, Ye have killed the people of the Lord. And it came to pass when the congregation was gathered against Moses and against Aaron that they looked toward the tabernacle of the congregation, and behold, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. So again, God just appears. But they're blaming again, they're blaming Moses and Aaron for killing these people. It's actually God who opened up the earth and swallowed them whole into the pit of hell. But they're still attacking the men of God, the authority that God's put there. But they should be grateful that, firstly, they didn't go down into the pit. But also, they should have received the warning and the chastisement from God, you know, that, hey, this is not something we want you doing. You saw what happened to them. Don't let this be you. What's the next thing? The next day, murmuring and complaining against the men of God. They didn't learn anything from what they saw. So it, it just makes you wonder, you know, how much they ever remembered of, of what they saw and heard God do for them. But just imagine that if you're murmuring and complaining against, say, your pastor or your boss, and then a, the pillar, pillar of fire just appears, and it's God, and he's just saying, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> seriously. Like, that's what happened here. God appears actually in the tabernacle, you know, and... But it's just, I just find it so disgraceful how, how these people behaved, but also I understand that we also can behave this way. It's, it's, it may take a while for some of us to get backslid to a point where we do that, but you don't even want to start down that road. You don't want to be murmuring and complaining now and letting that build upon itself. Because sin, sin just doesn't happen overnight. It's something that builds up over time. You allow it into your heart, and then it just becomes a pattern. But we should, never, we should never tempt the Lord. We should never test the Lord. You know, Matthew 4, 7, this is where Satan's tempting him. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. You know, so we know what it is and how God looks upon it. So how do we avoid this? Because um, that's the important part is, you know, the answer to murmuring and complaining is learning to be content with what you have and to always keep in remembrance the things that God has done for you. So I'll get you to turn to Ephesians chapter 4. So in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 8, it says, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. So... You know, this is something as, as Brother Sam brought up this morning as well. God gives gift, different gifts to different men. You know, so we don't envy other man's gifts. Um, we've, we've all got our place and our purpose in this church. God's got every one of us here for a reason. He's got you here because he's given you gifts. He's given you a way to serve the church, to serve the brethren, to be part of the body. You know, you might not be the eye, but you might be the hand or the foot. You know, there's so many different ways the Bible spells this out. But we're not to envy another man's position. We're not to envy taking, you know, taking the pastorship away from Kevin. We're not to envy becoming the boss at work. You know, we're, we're to have respect for those authorities that God's put in, put in our lives. You know, because we all complement each other. And that's why comparing yourselves amongst yourselves 
as we'll read in a second, it says it's not wise. So if you want to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and I'll read to you, we'll start in uh, verse 7. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 7. It says, Do you look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trusts to himself that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ, even so are we Christ's. For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us for edification and not for your destruction, I should be ashamed, that I may not seem as if I would terrify you by letters, for his letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. So there's people murmuring against Paul as well in, in the Corinthian church. He was saying that about Paul, like, you know, you're, well, you write pretty strong letters, but, you know, when you turn up, you're not going to actually do anything. You know, so we see an example of that as well. Um, verse 11, let such an one think this, as such as we are in word by letters, when we are absent, such will we also be indeed when we are present. For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. But we will not boast of things without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God has distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. So he's saying, look, God's given us the authority over this church. Paul had authority over the Corinthian church. And, you know, so he's saying, look, I'm not, speaking to you, I'm not boasting about something I don't have authority over. I'm coming in here with authority. And when, you know, my letters might seem harsh. Well, when I come, I'm going to be just as angry as I am in my letters. And I'm going to deal with you in the exact same manner. So don't think for a second that, uh, that he's just a big softy. You know, he's coming to actually fix the problems. Um, so yeah, in verse 17, But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. So these people are trying to commend themselves and trying to raise themselves up to the level of Paul and say, hey, we've got authority too. And Paul's like, no, I've got authority given by God. I don't know who you are, but you don't have authority over this church. And, you know, Paul quite often had to say, hey, I'm an apostle just like the rest because he was the one who came later. And so there were a lot of people who would murmur and complain against Paul and would cause him all kinds of problems in the, ch in the churches. But it doesn't create unity when you compare yourselves amongst yourselves and when you desire things that don't belong to you. You know, you should not be... You know, it's God who exalts the leaders. So the men who commend themselves are not the people you ought to respect. That's why I said, you know, when you start creating factions and people start raising themselves up, commending themselves as some kind of leader. Look, God's exalted a leader in the church and that is Pastor Kevin. You know, and if we ever have deacons, well, then they've also been commended as leaders in our church. But it's the Lord who commends and exalts. And so we should respect that position of authority that God commends. Because it's the Lord who can make us low and the Lord who can exalt us. Because he's the one who tries the reins of the heart. So he's going to exalt men that he sees as worthy. He knows who's worthy. So he's going to exalt those men. He's not going to exalt wicked men people who are in it for themselves, who commend themselves. Tell me, look at Korah. He was commending himself to be equal with the man of God. You know, he chose to lead him out of Egypt. The gainsaying of Korah is mentioned in Jude. That's what the gainsaying of Korah is. The only thing Korah said was, was him commending himself to be equal with Moses and Aaron. So, but we don't forget what the Lord has done. The lessons that he showed us through destroying the wicked, as we saw with Korah, but also the lessons where he shows mercy, such as feeding them in the wilderness. You know, the good things God does for us and the evil that he does to the wicked. You know, they're both lessons to learn from. And they're things that we should always keep in remembrance. You know, so it's important that we're thankful and grateful for everything he's done for us. Um, and that's why I love that hymn, that count your blessings, name them one by one. Like, that's such a great hymn, because if you count your blessings and you keep track of them, and you just constantly thank God for the things he does for you, then that's, that's how you should live your life. You know, this is how we don't forget and get into that trap of murmuring and complaining against the Lord. So it's about being content. So if you want to turn to Philippians chapter 4,
So Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. Again, this is Paul writing. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Now people love quoting that last bit, but they don't tend to tie it in with the previous bit. Where Paul's saying, look, I have no respect to want. I've got everything I need because even if I have nothing, I'm still content. You know, but if I have everything, well, then I'm still content. If the Lord blesses me, if the Lord takes away, he's still content. So that's what he's saying. I know how to be abased. I know how to have nothing and I know how to abound. I know how to be rich and to have everything. But he says, whether I'm full or hungry, whether I'm suffering need, he said, look, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. That's where his focus is. His focus is on the things of God. And he says, look, it doesn't matter... <laughs> doesn't matter if I'm without, I'm still content. You know, so that's, he's not coveting other people's things. We read earlier in the sermon how he said, look, I've, I've sought after no, I've covered no man's gold or silver. You know, he's not looking for those things. You know, and that's t- at times where I'm sure he's hungry. He's like, well, you know, some food would be good right about now. Right. Like you can see some people eating over there. He's like, mm, that, that smells pretty good. But it's like he's just content with wherever he is because he knows God's going to take care of him. And he's not coveting after things that other men have. I just drop down to verse number 18, Philippians chapter 4. It says, But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odour of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So while Paul was perfectly content in whatever state he was, The brethren in this church of Philippi, they blessed him and they sent him things when he was at Thessalonica. And the Lord will provide, he will bless you so we don't need to murmur and complain to get it. The more content you are, the more God will actually be happy to give you. The more you'll abound. And just another point is to be generous with what the Lord has given you and he will bless you. So these people, Philippi, they were very generous with what they gave to Paul. And Paul said, look, now I'm abounding because you've given so much, and I have no, I have no needs. Um, but, you know, the world has that saying that the squeaky wheel gets the grease, but it's not about us complaining to God to get what we want. You know, God knows what we need. He already knows that we need food and raiment. We don't need to complain and murmur and, and desire things that we don't really need, but <laughs> we might want in our heart. So I'll get you to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy 6, verse 8. And we all know this verse as well. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich fall into, temp- into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some have coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hath professed a good profession before many witnesses. So whatever the Lord's given you, just be content. Because it shows here that lusting and seeking after money, that's not how you get contentment. In fact, it says it leads to much sorrow. So that's why things like if you choose to work instead of going to church or instead of going soul winning or instead of going to, to something that you know, you know you should be at, the way of serving God, you, know, you should probably consider your ways and your heart. You know, if you choose that new car or that new boat or something else that your heart desires over helping a brother in need, when you're able financially to help them, but you'd rather, oh, you know, I'm sort of, I was saving up for that, you know, I'd rather have that. You really should consider your ways. And if you can't give liberally to your brethren in need, if you've got two coats and he's got none, then you seriously need to look at your heart. You know. 
So I'll get you to stay there in First Timothy. I'll just read to you from Second Corinthians nine. Second Corinthians nine, verse six to nine. It says, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God love a cheerful giver. So, you know, God loves when we give cheerfully. You know, he loves that we're not begrudgingly, well, I was saving up for this, but, oh, okay, I'll give it to him, but, you know, you better pay me back and it better be quick. You know, like if your heart's like that with the brethren, God's not going to give anything good to you. He's, in fact, he may take away even that which you seemeth to have. That's why anything you do for yourself it should never be at the expense of God or his people. That's the way we should live as brothers, you know, in Christ, as members of the body of Christ here in church. If anything you do is at the expense of your brother or at the expense of something you know you should be doing for God, but you'd rather just do what I want to do, you know, your heart's wrong at that point. So you'll still be in First uh, Timothy, look at verse 2. It says, And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. So he's talking about if you're at work and your boss is, a, is also a, a believer, you know, you shouldn't despise them, you shouldn't covet their position, you shouldn't envy them, you shouldn't, you know, rail against them or do any of those things because they're also a brother. Again, it's something you should not do anything else at the expense of your brethren. Um, in verse number three, it says, If any man teach, teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words. Whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. So again, it's about trusting what the Lord's given to us. We should be content with our boss. We should be content with our pastor. We should be content with the gifts and things that God has given to us, with the job you have, the amount of money you have. You should be content with all of that. But mostly we should be content with the church, because we've got a great church, Amen. and we know people that don't have any church at all. So we should be very, very grateful that we have a church. We have a great pastor who cares for us. We have great brethren who will get up and preach for us. You know, with it, there's a lot of unity and love in this church, which is something I've never seen anywhere else. So we should be grateful for that. So another way you should be content, you should be content in your marriage. So you, you've got to understand divorce is not an option. God hates putting away. You know, he hates putting away as much as he hates covetousness and envy and murmuring and complaining. In uh, Proverbs 5.18, it says, Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Let her be as the loving hind and pleasant roe. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times and be thou ravished always with her love. So, now adultery is a, is a symptom of not being content. You know, it begins with murmuring and complaining about your husband or wife. And, you know, what it leads to is committing one of the most grievous sins you can do to another person. It'll ruin your life to commit adultery, but it starts with murmuring and complaining. If you find yourself murmuring and complaining about your spouse, you really need to stop. You know, that's something that will actually lead you to do even more wicked things. And children also should be content with your parents. You know, we're commanded to honour your father and mother. You should be content with whatever they give you because that's what God's given you. So the lessons here are don't murmur against the man of God. You know, that's the past of the Kev that, that God has given to us, which for us is Pastor Kevin. But even in your own church, don't murmur against the pastor in your own church. If you can't be in a church where you can't stop murmuring or complaining about them, you should probably leave that church. You know, it's only going to cause bad things. So we don't murmur against the brethren either. Because we're all, as I said, we're all here. We're all part of the same body. God's got us all here for a purpose. So, you know, you not, might not be best friends with everyone here, but don't murmur and complain against them. You should still love the brethren. 
should still respect the brethren. And the same against the boss at work that God has given to you. So children don't murmur against the parents and don't murmur against the provision and blessings that the Lord has given to you. Because if he gets <laughs> angry with that, he's going to deal with you in his hot displeasure. And we've seen how angry he can get about that. So um, I'll get you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So we're not far off now from the end. So 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. The <coughs> Bible says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And we're all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. That's when they went through the Red Sea and they actually killed all the... Uh, Egyptians behind them. Verse 3, And did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent that you should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. So that's the lesson. We don't lust after the things of the world, which is what they were doing. They were lusting after the things of Egypt, lusting after the things of the world. And they weren't content with what God had given to them, with the promised land, with the food. You know, said so they ate of that same spiritual meat, which is the manna from heaven and the quail. And they, ate of, and they drank of that spiritual drink, which is the water from that rock. And Moses smoked the rock and water came out. But they were not content. And it says, with many of them, God was not well pleased. So... And in verse 7 it says, Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. That's talking about the fornication they did. It says, Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. So that's, like, that's in the book of Numbers as well. That's actually what is spoken of in John chapter 3. Um, where Jesus is explaining what that serpent was. You know, you lift up the serpent, you won't be... If you're bitten, then the poison will go. You know, it was a picture of Christ. It says that this was a punishment for them, that some were destroyed of these serpents because they sinned against God. It says, Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him... That thinketh he standeth, take heed, lest he fall. So you remember back in Isaiah 29, earlier on, it said that murmurers will learn doctrine. And that's why Paul here is saying not to be ignorant of the doctrines and the examples that are left un unto us through these stories in the Old Testament. Because the people of Israel, even after they came out of Egypt, they saw these great miracles. Um, you know, they saw the miracle of the Passover. They saw the parting of the Red Sea, the crossing over. They saw the pillar of fire and smoke, you know, as the Lord went before and after them. He provided them with manna and water from the rock, and yet they still murmured and complained. And this sermon is to, to remind us not to fall into that trap. You know, in Jude, if you want to turn to Jude, it speaks about wicked false prophets, false teachers, and this is how it describes them in verse 16. It says, These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaking great swelling words, having men's person in admiration because of advantage. But, beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time, who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves sensual, having not the spirit, but ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. So, you know, again, he's instructing us, the wicked people are the murmurers, the complainers, they walk after their own lust, and they don't have the spirit. These are unsaved people. These are wicked false prophets. But, you know, we're to think on the things that God has, God has done for us, the things that he's given to us. Because you know, we don't want to murmur and complain against him. 
We don't want to complain about our situation to do with food, raiment, you know, having a loving husband, loving wife. You know, children are inherited to the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is His reward. Like, these are all the good things God's given to us, you know. So we should be grateful for what He's given to us and not be envy- envying and cur- uh, coveting things that don't belong to us. You know, and the Lord Himself says He is our reward. So we should be grateful with that too. But we've got a great church, we've got a great building. We've got great members here, great brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, we have great teachers and preachers. And we have so much when others have so little. And we really need to put, it, put things in perspective about how well we actually do have it. You know, we should be grateful and content with what the Lord has given to us in all things. Because we've got a lot more than other people have. And, you know, he's, God provided us this building. He's provided us so much, like, the finances of this church are always in abundance. Like, it's just incredible how much God has blessed this place and how he's blessed the members here. You know, like, during this time, very few people have had any financial problems. You know, the, we've been well taken care of because we're just serving God, looking to him, and he's taking care of us. And that's how it should be. That's how God is with his children. Another thing, too, is we should also respect this place. You know, because this is the house of God and Jesus Christ died for this house. And this is supposed to be a refuge for us to come as the children of God. You know, so this is not somewhere where you bring your worldly lusts, your worldly desires and your worldliness. This is the place where we come to worship God, to serve the brethren. And that's the way it should be. Because what we have is what God's given to us and it's what he wants us to have. So we don't compare ourselves to others or what God's given them. Establish in your heart that you're going to be content no matter what state you are, whether, you're, whether you are starving. Whether, you know, but the Bible promises that you know, if you're a righteous man, it's never going to be breaking bread. It's never going to be without raiment. God's going to provide for you. If you're going without food and raiment, then you probably want to check your heart because God promised that he will provide those things to those who seek him first. So, and I believe that. I believe that you'll never see any of us begging on the street. You know, unless we're backslidden, unless we've moved away from God and God is cursing you for doing that. You know, he's, he's chastising you by putting you outside. But we also should not murmur and complain against God's ordained leaders. So whether that's your father, your pastor, your boss at work or the government, they are ordained by God. And Pastor Kevin's done some great sermons on that recently as well, on, um, on the authority, the God-given authority. So the last place we'll turn is uh, Job chapter 1. Yeah, we're, all, we're all pretty familiar with the story of Job, I think, but um, Job chapter 1, verse 20, we see how Job handled this, and we know he suffered more than anyone. Um, none of us could even say we've come close to suffering what, what Job has suffered, but just look at his heart. Job chapter 1, verse 20 said, Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head, and fell down upon the ground and worshipped, and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Now keep in mind, he's just lost his entire flock, his entire house, and all of his ten children. Everything's gone. And he still has the heart to say this, and to not sin against the Lord. But look at, in chapter 2, verse 9, look at what his wife says. His wife is a completely different story. It says, Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What, shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. So... I'm just going to read to you from Philippians chapter 2. But, um, yeah, you just see the contrast here between one who's content that he understands that, look, God can give me great things and God can take it all away because he's God. And there's, no, there's nothing I can do about it, but I'm just going to be content with whatever situation God puts me in. You know, and, and that was tough for him. Like, I can't imagine what Job was going through. But his wife behaved as I'd expect a carnal person to behave, but he's acting like a very righteous man. And we can see that righteousness. There's a reason he was said to be the most righteous man upon the earth at that time. 
you know, because you just look at his heart, and his heart was for God. And so in Philippians 2.12, it says, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who, which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. So again, let's not be murmurers, complainers. Let's not be envious of each other or what other people have and don't be covetous. Because he explains why in verse 15. He's talking about the church, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. So, again, we need to be separate from the world. You know, he's saying, look, the reason we don't murmur and complain and dispute is because we want to be blameless and harmless without rebuke. So without rebuke in front of the world, we want to have a good reputation in front of the world. We don't want to be just like them. They're going to complain. They're going to murmur. They're never going to be satisfied, but we can be content with everything we have. And we're just to be set also set apart from the vain things of this world. So, if, again, if your heart is on seeking money and seeking those riches, you know, you're just going to have a bad time. Because um, God wants us to serve Him and not our own lusts. You know, we're to be thankful and to acknowledge all the great things that the Lord has done for us. So we'll just pray.